Well, welcome everybody to our afternoon session. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce one of my former teachers, I suppose, uh, someone who first taught me ancient Greek and some Latin as well along the way. Um, Dr. Peter O'Brien, who's an assistant professor of classics at the University of King's College and Dalhousie, um, is coming out of a sabbatical year, I believe well-deserved, after having served as vice president of the college uh, from 2017 until must have been 2021, right? So well-deserved sabbatical. Um, uh, it sounds like you've been working on a commentary of sort. I yeah. What what's the what's the project? I thought you were introducing. So uh, he's keeping his cards close on that one. We'll have to wait and see for the. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, in any case, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Peter O'Brien. Thank you, Evan. Um, yeah. So uh, these days we're all experts in pestilence and also all novices. There's an open-endedness in what we've been experiencing these past two years that makes talking about plague in universalizing terms both necessary, we somehow need to find purchase on bewildering developments and parlous. To what degree are the facts and perceptions of the past applicable to us? To what extent not? Added to my own discomfiture today is the fact that I'm no expert in the field of disease in classical Greek and Roman sources. What I want to offer is an exploration of some Greek and Roman ideas about plague, mostly from literature and occasioned by circumstances. The first circumstance is, of course, this conference. Thanks once again to the committee for the repeat invitation. In the second place, it's our general situation about which I won't have too much specific to say, though it underlies my investigations and may I hope offer some, perspective from help, some helpful perspectives to many others we'll be hearing over the next few days, including my respondent, Dr. Mary Lou Redden. Um, I found uh, this morning's introduction to things very useful, um, if uh, uh, for no other reason to myself in finding some uh, consistencies in um, the ancient authors that I'm dealing with and some of the concerns that are, are, are coming up in this community and, and others as well. Um, my exploration is also highly selective since early in my research I learned that Greek and Roman author, authors were very interested in the topic of plague, pestilence, and disease in their epidemic and pandemic forms. And many had a lot to say about it in a world like ours in which contagious disease was omnipresent, leaving its marks in various ways to be picked up by contemporary scholars and interpreters. I should finally point out that I have very little to say about the forensics of disease and pestilence in medical, biological, and epidemiological terms about which there's a burgeoning scholarship, but about which I'm utterly unequipped to comment except insofar as they figure in what plague can mean psychologically, ethically, politically, and of course, theologically. In all of the sources I examine, plague serves as a focal point, a lens through which to examine the confluence of interests in crisis where individuals meet in community and how human being is distinguished from natural and divine being. In literary narratives, plague is also often a turning point where crisis forces the community or the audience to consider its self-definition and need to restructure. In these sources, plague disease is overwhelmingly destructive in corporeal terms, but also in terms of social bonds and interactions. Terrible though these representations are, there's sometimes a glimmer of hope in the clarity they bring to their audiences. And they all offer opportunities either to understand the community better or to point the way to its reconstruction on more solid terms. Before going further, I should pause for a moment to define my terms. 
When I speak of plague or pestilence, I don't mean disease or illness in its most general sense, but that type of malaise that afflicts communities generally, either as what we would call epidemic, where common symptoms manifest in a localized population, or pandemic, where common symptoms travel across boundaries of localized populations. For my purposes, those modern definitions blur, since the literary representations of community I'm going to look at tend to give those communities a universalizing character, as if they express truths not simply about a particular city or group, but for all. My focus will be the most famous plague of antiquity, that in Athens uh, in 430 BCE. It's most famous not because it killed the most people, but because it was described by the contemporary Greek historian Thucydides and through his own historiographical agendas, and though his own historiographical agenda shaped his account, its narrative movement, its tropes, and many of its individual features influenced writing about plague across narratives for the rest of Greco-Roman antiquity. I'll spend some time presenting the movement and character of Thucydides' account of plague, but before that, I'll notice how accounts of plague in Homer and Sophocles both anticipate the historian's treatment and in their very different ways of figuring the impact of plague in their communities, highlight the departure Thucydides makes in his own description. My investigation of Thucydides is followed by a look at how the Roman poet Lucretius transports the Thucydidean plague narrative into Latin verse and into the context of a didactic poem to show how the phenomenon of plague manifests in a different historical and literary context. In the readings I'll present of all of these texts, I want to highlight how plague narratives are both about plague and in a representational mode about far more, providing the occasion for us to reflect on who and what we are as individual human bodies in relationship with nature, with others in community, and with the gods. At some level, every presentation of plague in the ancient world reverts to Homer's Iliad, a poem probably first written down in the 8th or 7th century BCE, but which reflects a much older oral tradition. You'll recall that this earliest of Greek literary texts, and therefore by conventional reckoning, one of the earliest in the Western canon, begins with plague. Achilles' rage is, of course, the epic's unifying theme, identified um, as such in the very first word of the poem. His, well, I didn't, I didn't actually do that. Uh, his um, rage is directed at Agamemnon, the leader of the Greek community, otherwise known as the expeditionary force uh, or army camped outside the walls of Troy. That unresolved emotion leads Achilles famously to withdraw from the human community until near the end of the poem, he comes to recognize the inevitability of his own humanity through the death of his beloved friend Patroclus. Nevertheless, the narrative occasion of that rage is plague within the Greek camp community. It is of unstated symptomatic character, but Homer immediately identifies its cause and source, the god Apollo. He's angered on behalf of his priest Crusades, an inhabitant of a town near Troy. Agamemnon took the priest's daughter as war booty and brusquely refused to return her for a ransom as the custom of war allowed. The god hears the priest's prayers and showers the camp with his pestilential arrows, afflicting dogs and mules first and then men. For nine days, the corpse pyres burn until Achilles, the greatest of the Greek warriors, calls an assembly. His proposal that Agamemnon give the priest's daughter back in the interests of the army is met with contempt by the general in his narrow and arrogant purview, the heroic code that measures individual dignity and prowess by the tangible metrics of war booty will not allow him to conceive of a greater good for the community he leads. 
Though he's promised compensation by the other Greek leaders, Agamemnon hews to the commonplace view that honor is won and lost in a zero-sum game. When at last he agrees to relinquish Crusade's daughter, he insists on taking Achilles' own cherished war prize, Perseus, as his only condition. Achilles acquiesces in the deed, but at his own price of removing himself from the community of his fellows and thus from the war. The plague lifts, but the Greeks still suffer in Achilles' absence because he's their foremost fighter. His long absence affirms the fact that for mortals, the meaning and worth of existence can be recognized only by relationships with other mortals. And the highest realization of those re relationships comes by full participation in that community. Reflecting on the hallmarks of plague in this first Homeric instance, we can make the following observations. First, pestilence, the pestilence within the Greek community has a supernatural origin in the will of Apollo. But one couldn't say that the source is therefore purely external and unknowable. In the Homeric concept of community, the gods are integral, albeit from the perspective of humans, sometimes aloof members. Moreover, once an interpretation has been given about the cause of the plague by the prophet Calchas, whose office is to translate the divine will to human minds, there's little difficulty in explaining it. Second, this affliction affects the integrity of natural, that's to say physical, biological bodies. Thirdly, while the source of the pestilence in terms of immediate agency is divine, in Apollo, the God is moved by human communication, prayer, and he acts in defense of his own priest whose personal interests are thus bound up in his own cultic interests. The plague is therefore an expression in the natural sphere and by divine causality of disorder and imbalance in the ethical and communal spheres. The choices of human agents and reagents, above all Agamemnon, chief of his community, affect the proper order in things, the immediate expression of which is morbidity in animal and human life in his community. It goes without saying that the logical connections between causality and manifestation in the three points above depend on a cosmic outlook in which the divine, human, and natural realms are aspects of a symbiotic whole of overlapping spheres of being, and in which disruption, disruption, disruptions in any one sphere can have real consequences in another. For Homer, plague in the natural realm arises because of the ethical behavior of humans and of the interest of the gods in that behavior. The cure for this affliction, so to speak, is therefore not medical, it occurs by corrections or healing, not in individual bodies, but within the cosmic order. It must be said that in the case of the Iliad, those corrections are rather transactional, but that's consistent with codes governing human activity and divine interests in the human realm in the archaic period. Though codes change over time and place, Homer's treatment of plague has a legacy in later Greek and Roman literature. In subsequent authors, plague, its origins, the suffering it brings, and remedies for it continue to prompt broader reflections on the proper structure of human community within the larger cosmic order, and indeed of the place and purpose of individual human being within both. It's important to note that in Homer's representation, plague isn't a metaphor or an analogy of anything but rather an organic and sympathetic reflection of disorder in a tightly integrated cosmic whole. Now to step a bit closer to the uh, plague of Athens in 430. As I mentioned, the fullest account is that of the historian Thucydides, which structurally speaking is probably more influential in subsequent literary accounts than is Homer's plague. Most of what we know factually about that Athenian plague, moreover, comes from Thucydides. We'll turn to him in a moment, but first I want to consider the account of plague in the Athenian tragedian Sophocles um, in his Oedipus Tyrannus, in light of what we've already observed in the Iliad. 
The production date of that play is 429. And it's often assumed that even if the tragedy is set in a mythical Thebes, um, Sophocles' Theban plague is in some sense influenced by the playwrights and his Athenian audience's recent real life experience with plague. In this sense, it offers a much different contemporary way of thinking about epidemic illness from Thucydides. And it's a useful though limited comparator. Be it life of its own, a uh, mind of its own. Um, it, the um, Oedipus Tyrannus looks back to the Iliad in as much as plague is the immediate occasion of the dramatic action. The play opens with Oedipus, beneficent ruler of the city, approached by representatives of all classes who beg him to protect them from the affliction of the city. A spokesman for the citizenry and elder of Thebes explains the situation, which you see here. The uh, city is plunged headlong into the depths of disaster, engulfed by a murderous seething tide. Desolation wastes away the harvest, destroys our herds grazing in the fields, blights the women and makes them barren. Some furious god hurls pestilence in plague. If not with outright death, this pestilence nevertheless strikes at the essence of life in the city as a blight on the generative powers of cultivated nature, food crops and cattle, and even of human beings themselves. Women aren't having babies. Human community is imperiled at its root. In this case, the exemplary human figure is not an incompetent or ethically challenged leader like Agamemnon, or even a figure of impetuous excellence like Achilles, but rather a self-sacrificing ruler whose rise to power came about when he saved the city from a lethal monster, the Sphinx. He was able to do so because as a foreigner and as a man blessed with extraordinary intelligence, he had the objectivity and circumspection required to solve the Sphinx's riddle. When the city is threatened again with plague and pestilence, Oedipus, ever the conscientious leader, pledges to find the source of the city's pollution, come what may. The same cosmic assumptions are at play here as in Homer, but different characterization allows a different emphasis on the dilemma, as does the more tightly conceived concept of citizenry in the fifth century Greek polis or city-state. Though he's a different character from Achilles, excellent Oedipus also has his issues, as they say. If Achilles' withdrawal from human community illustrates the impossibility of humans living at an Olympian remove from society, Oedipus's rule over his community with Olympian perspicacity is limited by his all too human blind spot. He can't account for his own origins by blood and sex in natural animal generation. It's no spoiler, I trust, to remind you that Oedipus's professed objectivity is utterly dissolved into his subjectivity as the play progresses. He's not an outsider, as he thought, but a product of the royal house he occupies and of the royal consort, his mother, with whom he shares a conjugal bed. Oedipus himself is agent and proximate cause of the plague that affects, afflicts Thebes. Thus, like Homer's, Sophocles' plague reveals nature to be sympathetic to human activity and divine will. Unlike Homer, however, the particular symptomology of this plague, the blight on the powers of generation, is in a homologous relationship with the particular form of Oedipus's ethical transgression. That's to say, incest. Sophocles' stock and trade is tightly involuted, tragic irony that turns on the disjunctions between what the protagonists know and say and what the audience know is given by fate. In the action of the tragedy, the plague is the first instance of rupture between Oedipus's self generated and subjective reality and the true and objective one vouchsafed by fate and known perfectly and timelessly by the gods. Sophocles' presentation of the plague as analogical of the drama played out between individual and community develops Homer's more instrumental treatment of plague. Thus, Sophocles has his own legacy in literary representations of plague and pestilence 
in the Greco-Roman tradition, where plague represents more than medical pathology. That legacy, as I suggested, is not directly and obviously reflected by Thucydides, who may or may not have known Oedipus's, uh, sorry, uh, Sophocles's Oedipus Tyrannus when he wrote his histories. In Thucydides, the general context of the plague narrative is the Peloponnesian War, his great subject. This conflict between Athens and Sparta, the two most, most prominent Greek states in the fifth century, along with their allies, was actually a series of wars that stretched about 27 years, beginning in 431 BCE. Thucydides, an Athenian, an Athenian general, an eyewitness for many of the events he describes in his history, is the preeminent source for the period and a history writer of immense influence up to this day. Uh, you see, um, it's not just my audience that wants me to get on with it. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, the wars, as he describes them, were fought on the ideologies of freedom and self-determination of states, tyranny and democracy, and with military strategy, as well as diplomacy. Behind his description of all types of maneuvering lurks a profound sense of real politic in the historian's analysis of motives. Whereas the plague in Homer and Sophocles illustrates the sympathy of nature with human behavior and the interests of the gods in both in an intelligible cosmos, Thucydides gives much less credence to that hallowed world view. He is representative of a channel in fifth century Greek rationalism. He completely eschews divine causality, except as a point of view that some of his human players adopt and respect. In the sense of working within a cosmic order, he has no divine mechanics. Disease comes from outside the human community, cause generally unknown. Unlike Homer and Sophocles, Thucydides observes a, the pathology of disease closely, not just in terms of its net results or in what it, fig, in what it figures analogically. In this, he's likely influenced by one species of rationalistic thinking developing at the time amongst medical writers. This isn't to say that the historian simply reports the facts in a sequence of events. Thucydides certainly sees the plague as disclosing important things about what happens to society at war and how disruptions occur within the body politic. Naturally occurring disease provides a magnifying lens and an analytical perspective for the larger ills of society, but it's not really a metaphor for him. I don't mean to diminish um, Thucydides' literary quality at all or the ways that literature influenced his writing. He's brilliant in striking out in new directions generically and for his powers of analysis in distilling the character of community and individuals within it. What's important to note for our purposes is his departure from the integrated cosmic view underlying the Homeric and Sophoclean narratives. More than 100 years ago, and you've already seen it, uh, the great scholar Francis Cornford summed up Thucydides' outlook like this, and I'll allow you to read it again. Um, before moving to the main moments of Thucydides' account of plague and what he has to say about the nature of human community and ethical choices within it thereby. So uh, there's, um, you know, there's some um, aspect of the um, tension between chance and providence that um, was discussed this morning um, in this worldview, which sees fortune as having a real agency in things. Um, the immediate occasion of the plague in Thucydides is the Spartan invasion of Attica in 430. The populace retreated inside the city walls and soon after, disease spread quickly. Um, it's an essentially three-part narrative um, that describes the plague in terms of causes, symptomology, um, and epidemiology. The historian's introductory comment notes that a pestilence of such extent and mortality was nowhere remembered. 
The first attempt to address the illness, Thucydides says, were those of physicians. They became sick because of the frequency of their contact with the infected, and many died. Furthermore, says the historian, nor did any human art succeed any better. Supplications in the temples, divinations, and so forth were found equally futile, till the overwhelming nature of the disaster at last put a stop to them altogether. Despite his dismissal of divine recourse, it's not as if Thucydides believes that medical science could be effective either. Indeed, the tenor of Thucydides' treatment of the pestilence is very different from what we've seen in Homer and Sophocles, especially insofar as causality is concerned. This is the historian's own characterization of the uh, narrative method he's about to follow. Uh, no. <laughs> Um, oh, wow. Yeah. You could have told me. Uh, <laughs> um, so all speculation as to its origin and its causes, if causes can be found adequate to produce so great a disturbance, I leave to other writers, whether lay or professional, for myself, I'll simply set down its nature and explain the symptoms by which perhaps it may be recognized by the student if it should ever break out again. This I can the better do as I had the disease myself and watched its operation in the case of others. This encapsulates some of the hallmarks of Thucydidean historiography. He purports to lay down an accurate description vouchsafed here by autopsy, eyewitness uh, seeing, um, a favored form of authority for him. Key here is the avoidance of ultimate causality, whether medical or theological. The focus is on accurate representation in words. It's true that there's more than meets the eye in the phrases, its nature and its operation in the case of others. For Thucydides is certainly interested in the implications of the plague for individual character and community integrity, as we'll see. But those observations are made in the context of a worldview without the assumptions of hierarchical ontology or cosmic order uh, that Homer and Sophocles had. Thucydides fo follows these introductory remarks about cause and origin with his symptomology. The long rehearsal of symptoms as we've noted, informed by his own experience, um, are informed by his own experience as much as by medical writing. For generations, scholars used, uh, have used this symptomology as a basis of their own speculation on the identity of the disease, some, something I warned you I wasn't going to occupy me very much. Modern <laughs> theories run from uh, bubonic plague to typhus to viral hemorrhagic fever. Um, suffice it to say that Thucydides describes it um, uh, um, as a malady that afflicted the head first, then progressed downwards, it was characterized by inflammation of the eyes and nose and throat before moving to internal organs. Bodily strength was more or less retained until the seventh or eighth day from onset, but after that, bowel ulceration and diarrhea followed, causing a weakness that was fatal. Extremities were sometimes lost by those who survived. And some survivors suffered cognitive effects as well, a kind of anticipation of the historian's subsequent analysis of the radical psychological effects of the affliction. Others, he says, were seized by an entire loss of memory on their first recovery and did not know either themselves or their friends. There's nothing like the causal or analogical threads that link ethical behavior to pestilence in the earlier authors. Thucydides' description is most interesting though when he reflects on the effect that the plague has had on the citizenry of Athens um, and their sense of commonality. In describing the perniciousness of the disease and its resistance to treatment, Thucydides presents it as a disruptor of all rational expectations or anticipations. Its resistance to intellect and art is mirrored in the universality of its infectiousness. It blocks out all other disease. The plague is the great leveler. Some died in neglect, he says, others in the midst of every attention. 
no remedy was found that could be used as a specific for what did good in one case did harm in another. Strong and weak constitutions proved equally incapable of resistance, all alike being swept away. The historian delves deeper in the very next section. By far the most terrible feature in the malady was the dejection which ensued when anyone felt himself sickening, for the despair into which they instantly fell took away their power of resistance and left them a much easier prey to the disorder. As a complication of this despair is the fact that many died because they lacked those willing to care for them, and those that did, motivated by goodness, arete, in Greek, and honor, aiskune, caught the infection, increasing the mortality and compounding despair. It's important to note that both of these terms come from the vocabulary of communally validated ethics and morality. They're features of the common glue that bound people together, and their display by some and not by others speaks to the fact that that glue was in fact dissolving, that the plague was eroding mores as well as bodies. Thucydides speaks warmly of those who survived the disease and compassionately cared for others, perhaps with the gratitude of one who'd survived the disease, perhaps with the self-congratulation of one who'd acted so himself. Nevertheless, his circumspection, not to say cynicism, tempers his praise when he says that some survivors imagined that they'd be immune from any disease forever. Such, we may suppose, was another facet of the cognitive distortions of reality created by the plague. From individual reactions to the disease, Thucydides passes epidemiological analysis, examining the deeper societal consequences of the plague. Because the countryside was being besieged by the Spartans, many people from the country swarmed into the city, causing overcrowding and increasing the matrix of infection. Memorable images arise. As there were no houses to receive them, they had to be lodged at the hot season of the year in stifling cabins where the mortalities ra mortality raged without restraint. The bodies of dying men lay upon one another and half dead creatures reeled about the streets and gathered round all the fountains in their longing for water. The blurring of essential biological boundaries between living and dead leads to a reflection on the collapse of distinctions in institutions and customs. The sacred places also, he says, in which they had quartered themselves were full of corpses of persons that had died there, just as they were. For as the disaster passed all bounds, men, not knowing what was to become of them, became utterly careless of everything, whether sacred or profane. Note that the reference to sacred places is simply an observation of behavior during siege. Nothing is asserted here about divine causality or reaction to this sacrilege. The um, narrative turns from mounting numbers of corpses to further perversions of custom. Um, all the burial light rites before in use had become completely um, ignored and uh, uh, people uh, followed this uh, horrific uh, practice of uh, taking the funeral pyres uh, prepared for others for their own use. This is a, a deep violation of um, uh, Greek ideas of propriety in terms of care for the dead. This scene of utilitarian opportunism seems not so terrible to us, but to the Greeks, it was horrific. It has its own particular legacy in Lucretius, as we'll see. Um, in the historian's narrative, it serves this scene as a platform for his penultimate observation on the simultaneous leveling and the perversion the plague uh, inflicts on the city. Um, men now did just as they pleased, coolly venturing on what they'd formerly done only in a corner, seeing the rapid transitions produced by persons in prosperity suddenly dying and those who before had nothing succeeding to their property. So they resolved to spend quickly and enjoy themselves, regarding their lives and riches as alike things of a day. 
perseverance in what men called honor was popular with none. It was so uncertain whether they would be spared to attain the object. But it was settled that present enjoyment and all that contributed to it was both honorable and useful. Fear of gods, law of man, there was none to restrain them. These inversions of normal civil society and disrespect for laws and religion are very Thucydidean in formulation. The power of honor to safeguard individual behavior with respect to laws or religion has been obliterated in the loss of a stable form of community through the frequency and ubiquity of death. Um, fear of that death replaces all piety. Present enjoyment, a kind of sovereign hedonism, according to the historian, is all that motivates people. So that takes us then uh, to Lucretius. The Roman poet Lucretius poses a different set of problems in his version of the Athenian plague. In form, sequence, and detail, it seems so thoroughly Thucydidean that for a long time, scholars thought it simply a translation and criticized it accordingly. This is a common enough style of misreading Latin literature, especially where Roman authors so obviously take up a Greek model. Resulting judgments are bound to claim on the one hand that the Latin work is derivative and impoverished of imagination, and on the other that deviation from the models are defects. More just and rewarding readings of Latin authors recognize that when they represent episodes or passages from Greek literature in their own works, they're almost always motivated by the spirit of emulation, that competitive form of imitation that assumes the reader's basic familiarity with the original, relying upon that familiarity to make changes in contexts and details meaningful. Indeed, even the merest insertion of a close imitation into a new work in a different language and with a fresh context will make meaning on a whole range of registers that the original lacked and will, so be, cons uh, will be so consumed by audiences with perspective uh, conditioned by their own places and time. All of these uh, considerations are at play in Lucretius's version of the plague. And so I wanna uh, spend my time uh, looking at key uh, moments of uh, Lucretius's transmogrification of the uh, Thucydidean uh, original in his more deliberately metaphorical forms of verse. Um, the cumulative result of the, of the Lucretian transformation is a plague narrative that supplies a moral lesson offering a largely negative exemplar for individual and communal behavior. So there are a couple of um, crucial pieces of background for um, uh, necessary for understanding uh, this Lucretian transformation. The first is the historical milieu and um, Lucretius is not an author we know much about. Uh, he's thought to have uh, been born in 101 BCE and uh, died at 55. And so uh, it places him at the period of the end of the Roman Republic. Uh, at the beginning of his lifetime, Rome was sort of at its apogee of success in building a Republican empire. Um, and then the pressures that brought that success, uh, both in terms of external conflicts and internal um, jockeying for power uh, brought the um, governing structures uh, that balanced power and ambition into uh, uh, a, a crucial, uh, a, a deadly conflict. Um, so Lucretius in his life would have known civil strife and upheaval, including uh, coups and dictatorships, um, and they would eventually lead uh, to the decisive stages of civil war that would end the Republic itself after his death. The second piece of background you need to be aware of is the literary philosophical context in which the poet writes. On the literary uh, side, Lucretius is a predecessor of Virgil, deeply influenced by him, a contemporary of the poet Catullus and of the great uh, statesman and orator Cicero, who apparently edited uh, Lucretius' poem. 
And that poem, uh, apparently the only one he wrote and definitely the only one we have, is conventionally known um, as De Rerum Natura in Latin, translated variously into English as the nature of things, the nature of the universe, or sometimes the way things are. The uh, De Rerum Natura is a didactic or teaching poem in dactylic hexameters. Uh, it's the heir to Hesiod in Greek, the works and days, and to Virgil's Georgics. Um, it's um, uh, six books, uh, 7,000 lines long, um, and um, it's, as its title suggests, purportedly about everything there is to know uh, through the lens of Epicurean philosophy. Now, Epicureanism was the second uh, major post-Aristotelian philosophical system after Stoicism to have made a, an impact on Republican Rome. Frequently misunderstood and maligned, in part because it uh, so avidly recommended withdraw from public life as a way of achieving quietude of mind, ataraxia in Greek. It's never as popular as Stoicism. Nevertheless, it gained a devoted and eminent following, um, the uh, including Lucretius, of course. Uh, the founder of the school, Epicurus, uh, was a Greek of the Hellenistic period. Um, like the Stoics, Epicureans were materialists, but rather than believing that all things resolved to more or less rarefied seeds of fire, they borrowed from uh, the pre-Socratic philosopher Democritus the theory that all things are composed of tiny indivisible particles of matter called atoms. The less visible and substantial substances like souls or gods are composed of finer and more diffuse atoms. For Epicureans, all experience of the world is explicable in material terms and all knowledge ultimately derives from the senses. Cognition is only a more delicate and synthetic material operation than seeing and hearing and touching and so on. Whereas the Stoics thought that tranquility of mind, ataraxia, was to be found in identifying reason with providence or fate uh, that directed all things, Epicurus rejected fate and sought ataraxia in that very rejection. Rationality is thus crucial, crucial for his system, but it doesn't pervade the universe as does Stoic reason. For Epicurus, human beings could attain quietude all by themselves by exercising their innate reason without reference to an outside power. The central Epicurean doctrine retaining attainment of ataraxia is that pain must be avoided in order to attain pleasure, the highest goal of living. But this isn't, as has often been assumed, some kind of rank hedonism, as if pursuing individual pleasures with abandon were the goal of living. Pains must be avoided in prudent measure and pleasure will result. Moderation is the key. For Epicurus, disturbances of the soul are far more serious obstacle, obstacles for quietude than pains of the body. And the worst psychic trouble is fear. The worst kind of fear in turn are, uh, worst kinds of fear in turn are fear of the gods and fear of death. Epicurus, Curus wasn't an atheist, but believed that the gods exist only as models of blessed lives lived free from pain. They're therefore of necessity removed from the world of causality and free from care for human beings. Religion as the cultic worship of these all but non-entities was thus for Epicurus's Roman follower Lucretius, one of the greatest evils in human history. Later in the poem, Lucretius introduces Epicurus as the man who first among them uh, uh, who dared raise his human eyes to religion, the first man to withstand her, who, uh, religion who stretched down her head from heaven's realms and with her ghastly gaze loomed over mortal men. Further still, Lucretius gives us a memorably pathetic um, vision of the death of uh, Iphigenia, uh, daughter of Agamemnon, 
who, because of false superstition, believes he must sacrifice her in order to make his way to Troy. Tanta religio patuit suadere malorum. So potent was religion in persuading to do wrong. As for fear of death, the materialist foundation of all existence and our perception of it <clears throat> argues that it's nothing at all, and hence not at all to be feared. Lucretius explains death as merely the decomposition of atoms that coagulated, <laughs> uh, that coagulated to form the individual in life. At death, they simply dissipate into the common pool and self-consciousness with them. Epicurus's system allows individuals an autonomy limited precisely by the degree to which he allows the universe, the universe to be rational, to be knowable to human intellect and the amount of time that the rational human subject exists. The cosmic underpinning of a system that can find all external causality to the material, divi de denied divine causality, and limited all knowledge to what is perceptible by the senses is bound to be mechanical and somewhat dogmatic. According to Epicurus, the initial state of the atoms that composed the cosmos was one of perpetual unilinear, unilinear motion, kind of like the drops of water in a heavy rain on a windless day. Yet in accounting for how anything determinate came to be at all, a principle of unknowable chance or contingency was required. Lucretius supplied that lack in his presentation of the Epicurean creed. An unpredictable and unaccountable wayward motion of an atom or atoms caused collision and thus were formed all the various forms of being that ever were or will be. As Lucretius describes it, whole worlds came to be and pass away in an endless sequence of chance collisions, which he attributes, attributes to the klinamen or swerve. While such an account may seem rather lame when compared to the rationalism of Plato, Aristotle, and even the Stoics, the totality of the Epicurean system does have a certain poetic attractiveness in accounting for free will. Human determination swerves in the direction it chooses, free from predeterminate fate. However seductive that account of free will, will in an unpredictable universe, as an ethical system, one might say that the Epicurean is not very well suited to the communitarian ideal of Rome. At the same time, that communitarian ideal that had carried Rome so far in constitutional development and empire was under serious threat and had been called seriously into question by the time Lucretius was writing. And things would get even worse in the time following. In circumstances of despair, cultural incohesion, factional polarization, and even warfare, a fresh way of thinking might have its appeal. Epidemic or pandemic plague, proved the crucible for just this sort of societal disintegration. Even in Thucydides, where the plague narrative fits properly within the sequence of events, it also shines a lens on problems arising in the context of civil war. Lucretius co-opts Thucydides' template for his own purposes, analysis of a society in crisis, along with prescriptions for preserving equanimity and good relations on Epicurean uh, terms. So um, that's, uh, um, um, those, those were the, the, the two main preconditions for looking at uh, Lucretius. Just one more um, point uh, about Lucretius's transposition or translation of the Thucydidean plague. It's that it comes at the very end of the poem. Like it's the very last episode uh, in six books that run through all of the phenomena of the universe. And so it poses quite a problem for interpretation that way. Why in the world would he end a, a poem that way? And so inevitably there are scholars who say, well, you know, he, he was just getting ready to finish and then he died. Um, <laughs> people do that with Virgil. I don't like it. Um, I, think it um, I, I, think, I think it's not true to the way people uh, compose works. They don't, you know, write line after line in a in a chronological sequence. Um, 
So uh, the question is, um, what 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 might it mean? Um, and I think that these um, uh, th that this connects to the heavily ethical message of this didactic poem, and it presents the challenge, uh, the vignettes of a society rocked to its core by inexplicable calamity, provides the reader now completely furnished with the Epicurean worldview, and thus armed against the world's assaults on their composure with a handy literary and historical tool for self-analysis and correction. And I think that's borne out by individual uh, moments in Lucretius's plague that I'll just uh, visit. Uh, first, um, the origin and cause of the uh, disease. Um, remember, Thucydides, Thucydides makes it originate in the East, uh, e Ethiopia and Egypt, and it travels to Athens, presumably by a process of contagion. Um, uh, for Lucretius, the explanation of cause is um, an aspect of atomic behavior in the meteorological sphere. Um, it, so there are no invading Spartans. It's uh, it's the doctrine of the swerve, whereby alien air, as he calls it, drops uh, on sight. Um, the movement is spontaneous and brings with it change. Um, underlying, uh, and, and that's, that's uh, 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 underlying the poet's account and differing then from Thucydides is the concept of a closed cosmic system in which nature is sympathetic with causes on a higher plane. This perhaps allies Lucretius more closely with his poetic predecessors, Homer and Sophocles. Yet here, pure randomness is enshrined in the very fabric of the cosmos. In a nutshell, this randomness is the adversary that faces down every individual in the world. And it's ultimately that adversary in the form of fear and anxiety that Lucretius's Epicurean philosophy is meant to cure. Viewed in this light, the specific trials of the plague become an emblem of human suffering at the generic level, and thus set a vivid set piece testing ground for the application of Epicurean doctrine. In terms of symptomology, Lucretius's free translation tracks the major movements of the Thucydidean original, but there are many subtle adjustments and additions that make the narrative serve the Epicurean goal more exactly. Some of Lucretius's choices are gauged to emphasize the way disease poses particular problems for the integrity of individuals, and that they're not just quarantined from, but actually deracinated from community. He's interested, as Thucydides wasn't explicitly, in the way the disease attacks the capacity for communication, the medium of rational exchange between individuals. Um, uh, he, uh, he talks about uh, the uh, pathway of the voice uh, being clogged and choked and the tongue as the interpreter of the mind uh, oozing pus in additions to uh, Thucydides' um, discuss disgusting um, description. As Lucretius's description proceeds, he anticipates his own passage devoted to the despair of victims in language that elevates the sense of threat to individual autonomy, while also blurring the boundaries between life and death. Thence the disease would start, passing the gullet to fill the chest and flood the heavy heart of the afflicted. And then indeed all the gates of life began to give. From the open mouth, there would exhale a rife stink like the stench of rank on buried corpses left to rot. And then all of the powers of the mind and body brought to the very brink of doom began to flicker. Mental strain ever danced attendance on intolerable pain. Um, wonderful uh, translation of uh, uh, A.E. A. Stallings in the uh, New Penguin, Lucretius in rhyming 14ers, amazing technical feat. Uh, the horrific trials of the sick remind the Epicurean reader that in a materialist universe, the gates of life are really notional, that the living are literally made of the same stuff that they are, and that death too, simply a resolution of the same material atoms, is also nothing. 
This is what lies behind the disgusting Lucretian addition of cadaverous halitosis, halitosis to the, the Thucydidean template. The awful, awful spectacle for Lucretius is not that of people in the physical pain the disease inevitably brings, but the mental anguish they're in uh, for fear of death. Other details, memorable enough in Thucydides, are given further vivid emphasis by Lucretius in order to provide the Epicurean catechumen with images for reflection. In the Greek historian, parched and fevered sick cluster around pools to drink in vain. In Lucretius, uh, some gave their fevered limbs to cooling streams and plunged into the wave with naked bodies. Many tumbled down into a well headlong from a height, mouths gaping open as they fell, a parching thirst that drenched them through and through and would not stop, made gushing floods of water seem no better than a drop. Insatiable thirst so poignantly rendered reminds one of Lucretius's treatment of the insatiability of sensible desires or for the rewards of honor and power at the best of times. Individuals forced to the extremes of forgetting that truth, that truth are doomed to more intense suffering. Even more excruciating is Lucretius's development of Thucydides' report on the maimed survivors of the plague. And if the hemorrhaging of foul blood did not leave him dead, the plague proceeded to the limbs and muscles and progressed even to the genitals. Some people were possessed with such grave terror at the door of death that with a knife they managed to castrate themselves and so hang on to life. Many lingered in this world, sons, hands, or feet. Some lost the light of their eyes. This was the price of such dread, at such dread of dying cost. Some fell into a deep forgetfulness and lost all store of memories and did not know their own selves anymore. The detail of self-castration is added wholesale by the Roman poet. Again, it evokes the extremity of fear for death, which prompts people to unimaginable suffering despite its inevitability. And what short of death could be more fearsome than loss of memory and self-knowledge? A kind of living death, it's thus all the more fearsome to an Epicurean mind. For all his orthodox Epicurean focus on the sovereignty of the individual and his version of the plague, Lucretius seems especially interested also in how the disintegration of individual bodily integrity reflects the in the disintegration of the body politics. Um, there's a repeated image of bodies in heaps. Um, and Lucretius following um, uh, um, Thucydides is also concerned to show how insidious that disease is in undermining some of the very terms of civil society. Um, that if a man shirked visiting his own kin falling sick, um, for his excessive lust for life and dread of death, he'd learn the fatal price of negligence, neglected in his turn. So shortly afterwards, he came to meet a shameful end. No one by his side to aid him, while those who did attend the ill, on the other hand, for sense of duty left no choice, compelled by pleas for pity mingled with reproaches voiced, contracted the disease, run down by labor without rest in the sick room. And that's how death took the noblest and the best. In emphasizing the randomness and unpredictability of the disease and its resistance to coordinated treatments, Lucretius comes close to reversing the symmetrical tidiness of death's commonality. This situation leads to profound despair as he formulates it yet again. Um, in these matters, what was saddest and most cause for gloom was that when someone saw the plague upon him, he would start thinking like a man under sentence of death and would lose heart and lay there listlessly, his mind sunk deep in morbid thought and dwelling on his death, gave up his spirit on the spot. So as we've said, Lucretius ends the poem um, with, the, with the, the, the plague, and this is the uh, scene that ends everything. 
for the whole populace was thrown in disarray and cowed. Each mourner buried his dead just as the time and means allowed. Squalid poverty and sudden disaster would conspire to drive men on to desperate end deeds. So they'd place on a pyre constructed by another their own loved ones and set fire to it with wails and lamentation. And often they would shed much blood in the struggle rather than desert their dead. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> a message again. It's almost, I'm almost done. And so is Lucretius. This is, this is it. That's, that's, that's the final, that's the final uh, passage. A puzzling conclusion to a puzzling concluding episode. Thucydides has his own version of the passage, but he doesn't mention the strife of families, one against the other, and neither does he end his narrative of plague with this scene. Is Lucretia suggesting a devolution of civil order to a kind of kin-based tribalism? That would be one way to proleptically read the Roman civil wars that would ensue in the coming years. On the other hand, by ending this way, could he be suggesting that civilization itself might start again on different Epicurean terms? The specificity of the vignette seems to militate against that reading. Because of its ab abruptness, many have been tempted to see in it nothing more than his failure to complete the poem. <laughs> Too easy a suggestion. Could it rather be that in deserting the narrative, just as humanity in the narrative of plague have deserted social and cultural cohesion, Lucretius is leaving his readers with a stark and final challenge to understand for themselves the way things are absent civil structures of support or a culture of caring. I'm afraid I'll be no more audience friendly than Lucretius was in answering that question for you. I'll conclude, however, by observing that Lucretius, like the other authors I've discussed this afternoon, constructs a literary plague out of the experience of a real one. With the passage of time and with historical, philosophical, and poetic imagination, the poet offers a perspective on this experience, making it a metaphorical microcosm of human beings and community under stress in his own place and time. That metaphor has carried and generated meaning for audiences at other places and times as well. Can the Homeric, Sophoclean, Thucydidean, or Lucretian vision of plague help us now? It would seem that our own poets, philosophers, historians, artists, and theologians of plague are already at work alongside our social and medical scientists to make sense of this one. It will be interesting to see what metaphors for life and death in community they'll deliver and how important those will be in our collective attempts to understand what the most recent pandemic has done to our worlds. Thank you.